Right now on Morning News Now, it's decision day in Michigan. This morning, Nikki Haley looking to gain any kind of ground against Donald Trump in Michigan's Republican presidential primary, the final critical test before Super Tuesday. In a general election, you're given a choice. In a primary, you make your choice. We have to make our choice heard in America. And from the campaign trail to the courthouse, Donald Trump officially appeals his multi-million dollar civil fraud ruling in New York. We have team coverage. Also this morning, a sign of progress toward a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. President Biden saying a deal is close and could be just days away. We will bring you the latest. Plus, extreme weather on the way for much of the country. We're tracking a severe storm system that's threatening several states with heavy rain, snow, even tornadoes. And dollars and cents. Worried about your wallet? Well, you're not alone. More Americans say they are cutting back on their spending because of the economy. What you can do to make the most of your dollars. It's at a time when we see more and more people putting money on their credit cards as well. So well, it's so true. Important conversation yes. to have. Good morning. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin this morning with the race for the White House as voters in Michigan head to the polls today to take part in the presidential primaries. On the Republican side, former President Donald Trump is looking to defeat his rival, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, for a fifth straight time. Haley has spent the last few days meeting with voters across Michigan. Polls show the former president does have an advantage in the state. In the Democratic primary, President Biden is expected to come out on top today, but there has been a push by some Michigan Democrats to vote against the president, instead voting uncommitted on the ballot. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer says she is confident in the Biden administration. I think in Michigan, you can always count on close elections. That's true no matter who's on the ballot. And that's why I think it's important that they are focused on Michigan. And I'm grateful that their agenda has shown um, problem solving and the values that we care about. So what can we expect today? Let's bring in NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. John, good to have you with us. So let's start on the GOP side. Former President Trump is the favorite to win Michigan. That would put him one step closer to winning the Republican nomination for a third straight time. So just explain to us what's at stake for both the Trump and Haley campaigns here. If Haley loses, realistically, how long can she stay in this till Super Tuesday? She seems to be committed to at least getting through Super Tuesday and perhaps even beyond that, um, you know, it would be a shock uh, if she won Michigan at this point. Um, there is not a path for her to win the nomination that doesn't involve Donald Trump uh, no longer being on the ballot. And yet uh, Nikki Haley continues to go forward. So, um, again, huge upset if she were to win uh, Michigan. Uh, she's so far been unable to identify a state where she thinks she can actually win it looks like Donald Trump is likely to uh, wrap up the nomination in terms of delegates uh, by Super Tuesday, or if not, by uh, what's called mini Super Tuesday following that. John, on the Democratic side, I mentioned this push by some in the party to not vote for President Biden. This is really over his handling of the Israel-Hamas war. In an interview yesterday with our Gabe Gutierrez, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer says she expects that some voters will vote against the president. Let's listen to a little bit of that. I think there will be a sizable number of votes for uncommitted. I think that it is um, every person's right to make their statement about what's important to them. At the end of the day, I am advocating that people cast an affirmative vote for Joe Biden because anything other than that makes it more likely we see a second Trump term, and that's bad for all the communities. So, John, Michigan played a pivotal role in determining the winner of the 2020 election. What are you watching out for today as voters cast their ballots? I think the raw number of that uncommitted vote uh, against Biden is going to be uh, something to watch because uh, it basically will give us at least some idea of what he's at stake, uh, you know, what he has at stake in terms of losing in the general election. We've seen Michigan uh, certainly in the last two elections in 2016 and 2020 uh, coming very closely. So, you know, a, a difference of, of tens of thousands of votes uh, could make the difference in Michigan, and Michigan could end up making the difference uh, across the country. This is um, not something that uh, Joe Biden is ignoring, um, nor is it something he can afford to ignore, nor is it 
uh, something that is uh, small potatoes. I, I really do think that watching that uncommitted number will be uh, important for, for certainly uh, the White House, uh, for those of us in the media trying to get a sense of what will happen later this year, and I'm sure uh, folks in the Trump camp will be watching it as well. John, a reminder that primary season is a little confusing mm -hmm. sometimes. Not all the delegates are going to be awarded today in the Republican race. A majority will actually be awarded this weekend at a state party convention. Real quick, <laughs> what more should we know about that? It's a circus in Michigan. Uh, <laughs> first of all, they've got this hybrid primary, as you point to, uh, where part of it's uh, well, part of it's awarded based on the primary result. Part of it's uh, a lot of it's done based on a convention. Here's the problem in Michigan: they have two different people claiming to be the rightful chairman of the Republican Party of Michigan, and they look like they're going to have two separate uh, conventions um, to try to determine who these delegates are. Uh, basically, uh, there was one person who was in that role. Uh, she, she was replaced by uh, Pete Hoekstra, former congressman, uh, but will not give up all of the sort of state party materials. There's going to be lawsuits over this. Um, I, you know, it, it's I'm trying to tr think of a term that's uh, appropriate for morning television. <laughs> And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> you painted a good picture here. It sounds like it's like a choose your own Circus convention sort of word. weekend. Yeah. So there we go. All right, John, thanks so much. Thank Appreciate you. It. All right, well, as Trump continues to hit the campaign trail, his legal team has officially filed paperwork to begin appealing that $464 million judgment handed to him earlier this month here in New York. That penalty was the culmination of a months long trial led by New York Attorney General Letitia James. She accused the former president of overstating his company's assets in order to secure favor favorable loans and insurance policies. The $464 million penalty figure includes the prejudgment interest that has accrued since the ruling was entered on Friday. Mr. Trump is also barred from running any business from New York for three years. NBC News legal analyst Angela Sanadella joins us on set to break this down. Angela, good morning. Thanks for being here. So the Trump team wants an appeals court to determine if, among other things, Judge and Goran committed errors of law. Walk us through what that means, what else was in this filing, and really kind of what you make of the legal case the Trump team has here. Yes, good morning. Well, first of all, let's be clear that this ap appeal is very unlikely to be successful. All appeals generally have a very small shot, and in this case, the the judge was so thorough in his written opinion to make sure that none of his legal rulings will be appealed or will be reversed. Now, that said, I see two main areas. First, the idea that this law is primarily a consumer protection statute, meaning in the past it's only been used against businesses, never applied to an individual. Mm. In this case, given the size of the judgment, also that it was against an individual for the first time ever in the history of the statute, could be a basis for appeal. The second regards statute of limitations. We've heard his team talk about this extensively, but in the same way that Ivanka Trump was dismissed from the case due to statute of limitations, his team is going to keep on saying that he also should be barred for that same reason. Let's talk about the money. Does he have to pay any of it or some of it while he's appealing? Yeah, so he has to put that money up within a 30-day period after that judgment was entered on Friday. Now, look, what he can do is get a bond company to put that money up, but that said, there aren't a lot of bond bond companies, especially in New York, that can put up a judgment of that side. So there remains large questions as to how this money can be put up. We have heard Letitia James say that if this money is not put up, that she will start seizing properties. It is very possible at this point he might have to start selling. I mean, we've seen here defendants like Alex Jones and also Rudy Giuliani have to be forced into bankruptcy to pay these huge settlements. And before, while we have you, before we let you go, I do want to switch gears here. The Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. This now, we are talking about the New York falsified business records case. He wants to issue this gag order on the former president. What do you make of that? Is this to protect somebody in particular, especially based on what we've seen in the past with gag orders? Yes, so it's been a pretty narrow gag order that he has requested for the jurors, for the witnesses, and also for the other prosecutors that are not himself. But the problem here is that you have to weigh this against the First Amendment, and that is massive. We always say unprecedented, but literally there's never been an active presidential candidate who could possibly be gagged from speaking in this way. Also, these are not anonymous witnesses. This is Michael Cohen as the star witness, who has talked extensively, who has made excoriating remarks against Trump himself. So it is it is unclear at what level this judge will decide to institute this gag order. He has to weigh the Constitution and also the safety.
All right, Angela Senadella, thank you so much. Now let's get to the Israel-Hamas war, where this morning there is new hope for a ceasefire in Gaza. President Biden was asked about the likelihood of a pause during a stop to get ice cream in New York while appearing on NBC's Late Night with Seth Meyers. He said he hopes to have a deal for a ceasefire by next week. Well, I hope by the, the beginning of the weekend, I mean the end of the weekend. At least my, my, my national security advisor tells me that we're close. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. For more, we're joined by NBC News international correspondent Josh Letterman in London. So, Josh, these new comments from the president come as Qatar is mediating talks between Israel and Hamas this week. Where do things stand with the negotiations? Well, there is a delegation involving Israeli officials, Egyptian officials, and as you mentioned, uh, Qatari officials who are in Doha right now uh, trying to hammer this out. Uh, but as far as the specifics of the deal, Joe, uh, there are frankly quite a bit of different scenarios that are floating around out there. And so Al Jazeera is reporting, uh, citing multiple sources, a deal in which some 400 Palestinians uh, would be exchanged for some uh, 40 Israelis. So roughly a 10 to 1 ratio. Our own Andrea Mitchell uh, spoke to a person familiar with the talks who said they're more discussing a 3 to 1 ratio, which would be in line with the previous hostage deal. Uh, and uh, there's also New York Times reporting suggesting a smaller deal in which uh, five Israeli female troops being held by Hamas would be traded for some 15 Palestinians who are convicted of serious uh, terrorism offenses. So the details a little bit difficult to pin down right now, but one common element here, uh, pretty much all of these deals involve some uh, cessation of hostilities for the month of Ramadan, which begins on March 10th. Josh, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that deal or no deal, no matter what happens here with what we're talking about, his forces are going to go into the southern Gazan city of Rafa. Now, that is where nearly a million and a half Palestinians have sought safety since the war began. Does if Israel have any type of evacuation plan to get those refugees to safety before a planned assault on the city? Yeah, well, this has been a controversy for weeks now, with the U.S. demanding a concrete plan. Uh, now Israel says that it does have a plan that was submitted by its military uh, yesterday to the war cabinet. According to two Israeli officials who spoke to our Raf Sanchez, they envision uh, many of these Palestinians moving into uh, Khan Yunis, which is the largest city in southern Gaza, has been the focus of intense Israeli bombardment. And so once that's cleared out, the idea is many of those uh, people in Rafah could go to uh, recent reopened Khan Yunus, uh, but all of those uh, those people in Rafah are expected to stay in the southern portion of the Gaza Strip. Israel not expected to let them go back to their homes uh, in the north. Uh, and in the meantime, the U.S. says it still has not seen any kind of a concrete plan from the Israelis. And Josh, I mean, the situation on the ground just keeps getting worse. In northern Gaza, there's growing concern about famine. What's the latest there? Yeah, well, the U.N. now says that humanitarian aid deliveries to the Gaza Strip actually dropped by 50 percent this month compared to last month. So you're absolutely right. The humanitarian crisis uh, is growing very fast. But uh, countries are trying to step up in creative ways, including uh, Jordan, which has started uh, airdropping humanitarian aid shipments into the Gaza Strip from aircraft, uh, including 40 tons of supplies uh, for women in the Gaza Strip uh, that they dropped in the last few days, Joe. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. The U.S. airman who set himself on fire in an apparent protest against the Israel Hamas war has died. The airman, who was identified by police as 25 year old Aaron Bushnell, called Israel's war in Gaza genocide and filmed himself yelling free Palestine before collapsing to the ground outside the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C. In a statement overnight, the Air Force confirmed Bushnell was a cyber defense operations specialist and was serving as a senior airman as part of an intelligence unit based out of Texas. The Air Force says the exact details of his death are still under investigation. Well, lawmakers are racing to avoid a partial government shutdown by the end of the week. It's a headline we have uttered many times. So what's going to happen this time? Well, this morning, President Biden is meeting with the top four congressional leaders at the White House to push for a deal aimed at averting the shutdown. The president is also expected to press lawmakers on passing the stalled $95 billion national security bill, which includes aid for Israel and Ukraine. Joining us now on This is NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin and our White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist. Good morning to both of you, Julie. I'll begin with you. Walk us through the upcoming shutdown deadlines and what's at stake here. Yeah, guys, just a couple of days away on Friday, you've got that first tranche of deadlines. Remember, this is because Speaker Johnson put in that latter two-step shutdown funding deadlines, which makes this 
so much more complicated. So coming up this Friday, you see it on your screen, you've got a shutdown of the Agriculture Department, Energy, Housing and Urban Development, Veteran Affairs and Transportation. That's about a fourth of the government, so the shutdown would affect all of those agencies. Then fast forward to next Friday, March 8th, if they don't meet that deadline, then you got the shutdown of the Department of Defense, State and other matters there too, like judiciary uh, and other federal agencies. So certainly this is a big deal and a partial government shutdown would affect millions of people, millions of workers and all of these agencies, I should add, already began putting out their plans in a case of a shutdown in case lawmakers can't get to an agreement, which the clock is ticking. Julie, what are we hearing from lawmakers about this? I mean, are we likely to get a deal by March 1st? We've been in this situation a lot of times. Mm -hmm. We sure have. Our viewers know that countdown shutdown clock they've been seeing all year long because of policy differences. But in this case, it really seems like this is more political. There aren't a lot of policy disagreements between Senate and House appropriators who've been working on these year-long bills for the last couple of months. But the thing is, Speaker Johnson certainly has a lot of pressure from hardliners. Yesterday, we heard from Leader Schumer on the Senate floor. Reminder, the House isn't even back until tomorrow, even though Speaker Johnson is going to the White House today. I want you to listen to what Schumer said and John on the flip side. I hope the House continues to work with us in good faith to make that happen. But time is short. Time is short. We have the means <clears throat> and just enough time this week to avoid a shutdown and to make serious headway on annual appropriations. But as always, the task at hand will require that everyone rows in the same direction. Of course, that was Republican leader McConnell there on the backside. Schumer and McConnell here, though, different parties clearly on the same page. They don't want to shut down. But sources tell me that Speaker Johnson doesn't want one either. The problem is hardliners in his conference do want that year-long stopgap measure to kick in in April. That means 1% cuts all across the agencies. That's something that former Speaker McCarthy negotiated with President Biden last spring to raise the debt ceiling. So a lot going on here. We'll see if they can get there by Friday's deadline, but certainly a shutdown down will not be good for anybody. Mm. Aaron, let's bring you in here from the president's perspective. What will his message be to the congressional leaders on this looming shutdown? Well, the White House has suggested that uh, former President Donald Trump is really the hardliner in chief here, putting his thumb on the scale as efforts to get these measures passed through Congress uh, have been slowed. And so today, I think what we'll see is President Biden and Vice President Harris joining together with the four top congressional leaders uh, at the White House to have a conversation. The White House says the president intends to uh, push Congress to try to get something done, to move these bills that would fund the government beyond the first deadline on Friday. And also, the president wants to talk about national security. We know that there's been a measure passed in the Senate that would provide uh, funding for Ukraine, for Israel, for uh, the, originally for the border, and now there's a separate border effort. But uh, it seems as though the, the, the White House feels like these are things that Congress needs to get done. It's on Congress to do the work to get these bills passed, to get these measures passed, and to keep uh, working. But the White House knows that the president uh, is one who feels as though he can bring people around a table and sort of talk through some of the hard points uh, and create some reconciliation to try to get the, the ball moving. We don't know that that's going to happen in this instance. There, As Julie noted, there are so many other factors at play here uh, that it, it remains to be seen what exactly it is the president will do. We've asked about the strategy going into today's meeting uh, and, and not really gotten a response from the White House about that, really just one that says, you know, it's, it's time to get something done and the president's going to make that point today before he goes to the border and talks more about national security next week, uh, rather this week, and then we'll hear the State of the Union next week, guys. Aaron, we also expect the president to bring up that national security bill still struggling to get through the House, mm -hmm. includes aid for Ukraine along with aid for Israel. What more can we expect there? Yeah, this is something that every member of the administration who, who makes a public appearance has really taken time to try to say this is a major issue that the U.S. needs to be concerned about for our own national security purposes and for global security, really. There, this, this need to, uh, to pass this, this security supplemental to get Ukraine weapons uh, as it's starting to falter a bit in its effort against Russia. Uh, and also the, 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 the national security funding portion that would affect Israel in terms of providing military assistance there, but perhaps more importantly, uh, would create some avenues for humanitarian aid to be increased from the U.S. going into, the, into Gaza to help the Palestinian people. So a lot on the president's agenda here, and we're going to hope to hear from 
uh, perhaps the White House this afternoon when the uh, press secretary speaks, and potentially from these congressional leaders as they leave the meeting. There will be a camera right outside the West Wing. All right, Julie and Aaron, thank you both very much. A severe storm risk stretching from Missouri to Michigan today. So let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Angie Lastman is with us in studio. Hey, Angie, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Good chunk of the Midwest is included in this threat that we could see develop here as we get into the afternoon, evening, and even overnight hours tonight. 41 million people included that. You can see some major cities as well, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, Louisville, all included in that slight risk for us to see the hail up to golf ball size. We could potentially see wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour and not ruling out uh, the potential for a few tornadoes across this region as well. Again, the potential is there for this to occur after dark as well. We know how dangerous nocturnal tornadoes are. Here's the deal as far as the storm system is concerned. It's a big one. It's powerful. It's going to be moving across this region here over the next day or so. We head into tomorrow and you can see the heavy rain uh, and the snow that will track across the Midwest. It shifts out east and we're talking about the east coast being impacted by those with those same kind of impacts, not the severe weather, but the rain, the snow as we get into your Wednesday behind it much colder conditions we've seen kind of a roller coaster ride as far as our temperatures have gone for the middle of the country the Midwest even the Northeast over the next couple of days and we've got a lot of changes coming with regards to that we've also got some uh, some good soaking rain for some folks I think uh, the more widespread amounts quarter of an inch to a half an inch is more likely but you can see some of these spots picking up up to an inch or even two inches of rain by the time we get through your Wednesday and it's not just the east that's dealing with our next storm system. We've got one out west, not quite as many of these winter alerts up, but 7 million people included in those, mainly focused across portions of the Pacific Northwest. That's where the heavy rain is going to be a, a big issue. Once again, no surprise here. We've got wind that we'll have to deal with as well for coastal parts of Oregon and Washington. And we'll see this working into this region here as we get into your Wednesday, eventually Thursday. Notice the snow that will be draped across those mountain regions. We could see anywhere from an inch to two inches per hour. That that means that travel is going to be really difficult, near impossible in some of these regions, especially on those mountain roads. Heads up there and we'll pick up likely a good amount of snow for some folks. Four to six feet is the more likely amounts. We could see higher than that, of course, especially in the higher elevations. But this will be something that we have to deal with, guys, as we get into the next couple of days. Uh, and they've, of course, had no rest there when it comes to uh, difficult weather. So we'll have this next system that works on shore for them uh, and impacts them there. Um, I think up to 12 feet of snow is going to be possible wow. across parts of the Sierra range, Lake Tahoe, Yosemite, Mount Whitney, all included in that up to Mount Shasta. So heads up for folks there and the rain a little difficult too, um, up to three, maybe even five inches of rain. So will be impactful for folks in that region through at least Thursday. So same for me, you said feet, 12 feet, 12 feet. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a difficult one. You know, we say oftentimes difficult travel, but that that'll be Ooh, near yeah. impossible across that region. Mm. Wow. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Much more to come here on Morning News Now later this hour. Calling out a new survey shows Gen Zers are most likely to take a mental health day at work. We'll break down the numbers plus what you can do to prevent burnout. Up first, new this morning, Prince William pulling out of an event for what's being called a personal matter. What Kensington Palace is saying after the break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Hundreds of migrants are now being dropped off by Customs and Border Patrol at bus stops all across San Diego. Local governments and shelters are now struggling to manage the situation, forcing one shelter to close last, last week due to a lack of funding. NBC News correspondent Edwin Lopez has more on how migrants and those trying to help are coping. Another major U.S. city, San Diego, buckling as it grapples with a growing number of migrants. Border Patrol dropping off hundreds of people at local bus stops from as far away as China and as close as Mexico. Colombia. I'm from Senegal. I'm from Chad. Volunteers were told to expect more than 350 street releases in the metro area on Friday alone. I wanted to see what was happening down here. I know that they're going to be increasing the number of uh, migrant drop-offs to about 1,000 a day, and, and that concerns us, especially considering the county has closed their program to house them. The county had been funding a welcome center for migrants since October. It offered a safe place to charge phones, eat, and use the bathroom before many continued their travels. But late last week, that funding dried up 
putting the burden on a patchwork of remaining nonprofits. Many of those relying on the nonprofit's help fleeing political chaos and crime. In my country, Ecuador is in a conflict armed internal. Bandillas want to take over the country. In a statement to NBC, Customs and Border Patrol said in part that, quote, this situation is the latest example of the pressing need for Congress to provide additional resources and take legislative action to fix our outdated immigration laws. Earlier this month, a political standoff in D.C. left no solution on the table. A bipartisan deal fell through. House Republicans unwilling to free up funds without sweeping changes to immigration policies. The Republicans simply cannot vote for the bill in good conscience. And that is why I declared it dead on arrival, and it looks like right now it may be in some jeopardy. California Governor Gavin Newsom blasting the ordeal, stating in part that, quote, when it comes to border security, Republicans in Congress have done nothing but create chaos and sabotage any attempts at progress. From October to January, Border Patrol released more than half a million people with orders to appear in immigration court. The dwindling funds mean less temporary shelters for them to go to while they wait to see a judge. Our thanks to Ellen Lopez for that report. Time now for international headlines, starting with some developing news involving Prince William. Claudio Labanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Just a good morning. Well, that's right. Prince William pulled out of attending a memorial service for his godfather, the late uh, King Constantine of Greece at Windsor Castle, due to a personal matter. Now, Kensington Palace said it will not elaborate further, but did say that the Princess of Wales continued to be doing well following abdominal surgery last month. King Charles is also missing the service as he continues, as we know, treatment for an undisclosed form of cancer. Now to Peru, where a health emergency has been declared across most of the country due to the growing number of dengue cases. Officials say the number of cases during the first seven weeks of the year is twice as high as during the same period last year. The spike is occurring during a time of higher than usual temperatures and heavy rains in the country. And we end up with a miracle, as Japan's space agency calls it. Defying all odds, Japan's moon lander has survived the challenging two weeks lunar night. That's when temperatures can fall to minus 274 degrees. Japan's space agency sharing that the spacecraft responded to a signal from Earth on Sunday and that they are preparing to make contact once again after the vehicle cools down from high temperatures due to the lunar midday. The unmanned smart lander first landed on the moon in January, making Japan as the fifth country to land on the moon. Back to you guys. Had lots of moon news lately. Very cool. Claudio, thank you. Coming up, a social media showdown at the Supreme Court. When we come back, the arguments over two online censorship laws and how the outcome could impact what you see when you scroll. And it's a silent struggle impacting millions of people. After the break, an important conversation about eating disorders and how you can support loved ones who might be struggling. This is Morning News Now. We're back with new allegations of sexual harassment and assault against Sean Diddy Combs. Rodney Lil Rod Jones, a producer on Combs' latest album, filed a lawsuit Monday. He alleges that Combs sexually harassed and assaulted him while he lived at several of Combs' homes. Jones also alleges Combs forced him to engage in unwelcome acts with sex workers and that Combs and his staff engaged in, quote, serious illegal activity. He is seeking $30 million. An attorney for Combs said Jones, quote, reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. The Supreme Court heard arguments on Monday on a thorny First Amendment issue over laws in Florida and Texas. Those states passed rules that seek to limit social media companies from moderating content on their platforms. NBC News senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett takes a closer look. It's a First Amendment fight for the digital age. The justices wrestling with a pair of sweeping laws restricting how social media giants like Facebook and Google decide what and who you see online. These big tech oligarchs have made themselves the gatekeepers of free speech, and nobody gets to do that in America. The government cannot violate the First Amendment, and it especially cannot do so in the name of preserving free speech. That is Orwellian. At issue, laws passed in Texas and Florida 
Florida after former President Donald Trump was kicked off social media in the wake of the Capitol attack on January 6. The states restricting social media platforms from blocking users for their views and burying certain content, moves they say are needed because conservative voices are stifled online. But the companies say those laws infringe on their free speech rights, hampering their ability to police their own platforms, a concern the justices highlighted during arguments. When the government excludes speech from the public square, that is obviously a violation of the First Amendment. When a private individual or private entity makes decisions about what to include and what to exclude, that's protected, generally, editorial uh, discretion. The ultimate outcome likely turning on whether the high court views social media giants more like newspapers, free to make their own editorial choices, or more like phone companies, open to all, regardless of what a customer says or writes. Our thanks to Laura Jarrett for that report. Well, it is National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. It's a time for health professionals, organizations, and communities to raise awareness about eating disorders, their impacts, possible treatments, and support that is available. According to the National Alliance for Eating Disorders, more than 29 million Americans will experience an eating disorder in their life. The problem is so serious, researchers have found that every 52 minutes, someone loses their life to complications from an eating Eating disorder. Joanna Candell is the founder of the National Alliance for Eating Disorders and joins us now on set for this important topic. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, I mean, it's important to note there are different types of eating disorders. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that and which sure. demographics seem to be impacted. Most. Sure. Well, as you said, one in every nine Americans will experience an eating disorder in their lifetime. And eating disorders can be, you know, widely known eating disorders like anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa binge eating disorder, but there's also lesser known eating disorders such as avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which happens primarily in little children that's more of like a picky eater, but is mm. really a manifestation of anxiety or fear around the act of eating. Um, we also know that eating disorders do not discriminate between age, gender, race, class, socioeconomic status, um, sexual identity, ability, and body shape and size. So. You, on the whole, you may not even know that an eating disorder is there just by looking at the individual. I also think that there's a lot of times where I've done some reporting on how it's difficult in some cases, like when you mentioned gender, like for boys to even be diagnosed because there's not a lot of parameters around them, like even scientifically for a doctor. I know LGBTQ communities, minorities, mm -hmm. they're also at risk. Tell us how some yeah. of these different subsets are impacted more, maybe because it's difficult to diagnose them. Well, that's exactly it. We live in a world where we have that archaic stereotype that eating disorders affect typically white, cisgender, a female identified, thin body, middle to upper class. But we know that so many individuals that hold marginalized identities are so much less likely to be identified and diagnosed and then sent on to, uh, to, to treatment. We know that individuals in the, in the trans community are four times more likely um, going to develop an eating disorder than their cisgender um, counterparts. There are a lot of misconceptions yeah. surrounding eating disorders. What are some of the most common ones and what do we do to, to sort of break those yeah, misconceptions? Yeah, that eating disorders are a choice. I mm. mean, I think when I tell people that eating disorders are biologically based brain illnesses, people just look at me, or that mm. they're hereditary, they run in families. Um, we know that eating disorders is that combination of genetics and environment. We live in a world that's very body-centric, weight, weight centric and yet when you have those genes and the environment that comes together then eating disorders will will develop absolutely um if somebody is suffering or you think that somebody that you care about might be having a hard time here how do you broach this conversation what support is there I think leading with compassion, using I statements, talking to the individual in one-on-one, -on -one, and know that you don't have to go through this alone. The National Alliance for Eating Disorders has a free therapist-run helpline Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. We can help walk you through. We also have free therapist-led support groups to support not only the individual that's struggling, but as well as the loved ones as well, because eating disorders 
don't only affect the person going mm -hmm. through it, it affects the family system. Having an awareness week like this, what is the impact that can have? You know, creating conversation allows individuals that are struggling in silence and struggling alone to know that they're not alone, to know that it does get better. As someone that had lived experience that struggled for 10 years and never told a soul about it or mm. never thought that there was life beyond eating disorders by having opportunities like this one this morning or saying to people, you don't have to be alone and, and there is help, there is hope, recovery is possible. Joanna Kendall, important week. We really appreciate you spending some of it with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. It's time now for our weekly mental health check-in, starting with how a crisis could be impacting Gen Z in the workplace, leading to 20-somethings calling out sick more often. Plus, would you bring a dead loved one back with the help of artificial intelligence? Well, we'll tell you why some experts think so-called AI ghosts could do more harm than good. Here to help us break down all these headlines is licensed marriage and family therapist Dr. George James. Dr. James, always great to have you with us. So let's start with a new report out of the UK that says members of Gen Z are more more likely to call out of work for a mental health day than older co-workers. This is against the backdrop of really a mental health crisis in young people. Tell us what's happening here and also why the study specifically found that women are struggling more than men. Yeah, uh, good morning, Savannah and Joe. Uh, you know, part of this is that, you know, unfortunately, when we've seen lots of changes and growth in so many ways, but so many women are experiencing a lot of backlash where uh, it, it might be hard conditions, whether health wise, whether uh, opportunities to grow and excel, as well as the, the, the increased mental health challenge. So a lot of women are overwhelmed, especially at this younger age, and we need to create opportunities for them to be able to get the care they need and not feel the stigma. And that could be very helpful for them. Good advice there. Let's talk about AI ghosts. Yeah, so researchers are predicting that we might actually be able to digitally recreate the persona of someone we loved who's passed away using artificial intelligence. I mean, most of us would maybe love to share one more conversation mm. with someone who we've loved and lost, but I have to guess there's some risk here. Yeah, you know, it, it's very tempting, the thought of like recreating the memory of someone that you've lost. Uh, but the, the challenge of this is that it might not allow you to go through the natural grieving process where you go through the ups and downs, the really tough moments, but get to a place of accepting that you've lost that, that loved one. And this AI generated memory could kind of create moments of anxiety or lowness or even dependence where you feel like you need to have this person around and not move on with the process of grieving. Also, doctor, there's a new TikTok trend. This is kind of a nice one. It's, it's called a 90-day dinner. So it, the idea is if you're going through a tough time, you schedule a dinner with your friends in the future, and hopefully by the time the dinner comes around, things have improved for you. You're kind of in a different phase, feeling a little bit better. Tell us why ideas like this can help shift our perspectives and can actually be an effective way of getting through a tough time. Yeah, I really love this because it really talks a lot about our, the communities that we can create and being able to say, I'm in a tough moment right now, but I'm going to push to the future. I'm going to see the future in 90 days, and there I'm going to gather with my friends. They're either going to help me break it down, or I'm going to know that something has changed. And I'll, overall, I'm going to be able to feel better because I have community, I have people I love, and I won't feel so lonely and isolated. So I'm going to delay the problem right now, and I'm going to fix it in between, and then celebrate with my friends and family. Interesting yeah. idea there. I know. I wonder if you Good can schedule one every week. Yeah. Well, that probably yeah. defeats the purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Seven day dinner. How about we, exactly. we shorten that time yeah, frame? Yeah. Sorry, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. James, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time this morning. Always good to see you. Coming up, financial fears, a new study shedding light on how Americans feel about their money. We're going to break down why so many people are cutting costs, even if they're making enough. Stay with us. You're watching Morning News now. We are back now with a new study that's looking to get a deeper understanding of how Americans think, feel, and act with their money. Research by Wells Fargo Bank found that two-thirds of Americans have decreased their spending because of the current state of the economy. More than half of people say they worry about money even when they have enough. So what has Americans so worried about finances? Joining us now with more on what Americans are thinking when it comes to their money is the head of advice and planning for Wells Fargo, Dr. Michael Learsch. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great. 
great to be here. Always I'm, great to see you. It's great to see you too. I'm happy to talk about the Wells Fargo money study. So many great things. Okay, to tell us first just some of the highlights out of it. So you highlighted a few things that are really fascinating, which is there's an inconsistency between the economic data we see out there mm -hmm. and how Americans are feeling in their pocketbook. So when we think about this idea of money, uh, the people we surveyed say it's constraining them and it's making them make very tough trade-offs all the way to this idea of not having much left over for extras. And so we know inflation is higher than it's been recently. Uh, we know that rates are higher, so borrowing costs are higher. But it really is creating this stress on Americans, and they say more than they felt in their recent memory. Even teens say they're very stressed out when it comes to money. Wow, that says oh, something geez, right there. Teens wow. are even stressed out. Look, look, here's one thing in this study that was interesting. 57% of Americans admitted they need a mental reset when it comes mm. to their finances. What exactly does that mean? Talk more about that. How do you do that? So when we talk about a mental reset, it is tough. Yeah. Uh, but one of the biggest things is Americans felt judged by themselves and by others about how they were spending money. Hmm. Too much, too little even so much so that they're compelled to lie about it. Mm. And by the way, teens more than adults feel compelled to lie about how much they spend, compelled to lie about how much their home is worth, compelled to lie about how much they save or invest. And so when they talk about this mental reset, how do we get beyond this idea of being challenged and it being difficult to talk about money and be a more authentic and solution oriented? Because people said, it, majority said they didn't want to talk about problems anymore. They wanted to talk about solutions. Hmm. I, well, you'd think solution would come right from kind of making a plan here, but I know also you found here that we spend an average of just three hours a week planning finances. Now, to be honest with you, I'm like, I don't spend that much time. Or like, I don't know, you know, I don't set like that three aside. Three hours. Right, but then it also put in context, you know, like that's less time than we'd spend on social media or just doing normal household chores. I mean, what should we be doing on a weekly basis or even daily? Like, how do you incorporate this into your life in a way that's not intimidating? So when we think about uh, incorporating money in our lives, oftentimes we think about doing more money stuff and less of other stuff. So you saw nine hours scrolling social media, like, Right. videos. Well, we that's all also enjoy that. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, but we enjoy it, and, and sometimes we get caught up in that, which is fine. So the, the question is, that three hours we're spending a week, if we spend that, are we doing it with intentionality? So our survey participants said they realized they needed to be less automatic and more intentional when it comes to money. So one of the big tips is, you might have heard set it and forget it or make things automatic when it comes right. to your money. In fact, I would say you should do the opposite. You should be looking at your money every single day. So if you have a mobile app with your financial okay. services provider, download it, look at your money. That's good with fraud and scams to give you comfort that you're paying attention to your money all the way to looking at how you're spending because it's the everyday spending, the incremental changes you make, just small little changes over a two, three year period that's gonna change your life. I've literally just in the last two weeks started doing that and it is interesting because it makes you think more about a budget and sticking to a budget right, and things right. like that. I mean, the good news exactly. is people overall are optimistic, I guess, about their money. Just what are the best tips you have to help people moving forward? So when you think about that optimism that you highlighted, people do recognize their ups and downs when it comes to their money. So regardless of where you're at, whether you're in an up or a down, the key thing I would say are two. First, make sure you're articulating what you're trying to accomplish with your money. So we have a, something in our mobile app called LifeSync, manage credit and debt, manage spending, the top two things people put in that app to manage toward. Then you also want to inspire yourself. So in that same app, you can upload pictures from your own photo gallery to inspire you to do the things that you need to do. So I would say whether that's in an app, on a piece of paper, write it down, get it out of your head, the things you're worried about, and then manage toward it with things that are inspiring to you. You know, think of a Pinterest type of board. <laughs> Put it on paper, use those pictures. That inspires human beings to make extraordinary changes. Dr. Michael Lirsch, really, really good advice. Interesting stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. More financial headlines now. Bitcoin is soaring to highs not seen in two years. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so Bitcoin hitting a two-year high today briefly, topping 57,000 on signs larger institutional investors are buying the cryptocurrency now.
Bitcoin has rallied more than 10% in the past two sessions, boosted by news crypto investor and software firm MicroStrategy recently made a big purchase. It's also been helped recently by the approval of several exchange-traded funds or ETFs, which opens the market up to more retail and individual investors. Xi'an may snub the U.S. for its upcoming IPO. Bloomberg reports the popular fast fashion site is considering the possibility of switching from New York to London because of resistance to the U.S. listing. Xi'an was founded in China but is now headquartered in Singapore. It's reportedly determined it's unlikely the SEC will approve its IPO. Senator Marco Rubio has asked regulators to block the listing, saying the company needs to disclose more about its operations in China. And Netflix has started telling customers who subscribed and paid through their Apple iTunes accounts they will instead need to start paying directly through Netflix with a credit or a debit card. Netflix stopped letting new customers sign up for in-app subscriptions on Apple devices back in 2018, and that was to avoid giving Apple a commission. But it had allowed those who were paying through iTunes to keep their payment preference, guys. Mm, so Interesting. Yeah. Right. So I bet you half the people who are doing that don't remember that they're doing yeah, that. Probably not. <laughs> I, probably I was not. just thinking that. I wonder if that's me. <laughs> Thank you. All right, coming yeah. up, taking back the block. Up next, we'll take you to Chicago for the new efforts to transform one neighborhood with a painful past. This is Morning News Now. He's just Ken, and anywhere else, well, he'd be a 10. Even at the Oscars. Yeah, it is official. Ryan Gosling is going to be performing his angsty Barbie ballad live at the Academy Awards. Now, for a while, we weren't sure if this was going to happen. Gosling told Variety earlier this month he was open to hitting the stage, but that the Academy had not yet asked him to perform. I'm Just Ken is one of two Barbie songs earning Oscar nominations for Best Original Song this year. The other, What Was I Made For by Billie Eilish, which also just won a Grammy for Best Song. So get ready to tune in for all the Kennergy from your Mojo Dojo costumes. <laughs> the 96th Academy Awards is March 10th. Never forget, <laughs> as, as I proved there with Angie Lastman, you are Knuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That was at Halloween, remember? I was Ken. <laughs> Many times I was Ken. Okay, it was the only okay. costume I had. The Mojo Dojo really got me. All Santa, right, you're <laughs> Thank you. I didn't realize that's how that's said. All right, anyway, finally this hour. What started as an art project has turned into so much more for one Chicago community. It's called Unblocked Englewood, and the goal is to pay for home repairs on one block on the city's south side with a history of discriminatory housing policies. NBC News Now correspondent Adrian Broadus has the story. Inglewood is my home. I even have the tattoo. Tanika Johnson's home. Not only where I grew up and where I still live, but this is where my grandmother came. Is in a Chicago neighborhood with an ugly history. Historic racist housing practices. But with a program called Unblocked Inglewood. So right here, we can do a gazebo. She and Janelle Nelson add beauty. These are the homes and the individuals that have been impacted by racist housing practices in the mid-century and we're going to help them repair their homes and beautify their block. It started as like a photographic project. art project, but then yeah. the people in the photographs started talking to each other. Now, with nearly $500,000 awarded from the city, these social justice artists have revitalized 22 vacant lots and have helped nearly 75 residents like Melvin Walls. We came in in the early uh, 50s. With critical repairs. They fixed the furnace right here. They did the roof. He had a water leak. He had plumbing issues. And so we helped him repair that. Walls' father had a land contract. You know, from my knowledge, they were taking advantage of more or less a gray market for predatory loans, paying monthly premiums, never gaining equity on the home if they missed one payment. The houses that were purchased by black Chicagoans were often much more expensive than the prices for the same exact house that a white Chicagoan would pay. So there are just many, many ways that black residents were unfairly treated. Carla Bruni works with the Chicago Bungalow Association and has partnered with Johnson to help fund the transformation block by block. Getting these homes up to code costs about $65,000 per home. We've fixed up walls, broken pipes, just years and years of deferred maintenance, you know, it really just becomes incredibly overwhelming at a certain point for residents. There are four institutions that had over 100 contract homes in deeds and trusts and 
those amount to more than $9 million. Researcher Amber Henley quantifies how much black families have lost over the years. She says the next step, holding lending institutions accountable. But we do have just cause to go after this one institution. But nobody talks about why. Back on the block, restoration is beyond repairs. Unblocked is more than an art project, it's a statement. Helping restore some of that dignity and equity. I need so much help. This house right here, my mother passed away, and it's kind of keeping my family together. All right, thanks to Adrian Broaddus for mm -hmm. that story. That is going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, we are watching more wild weather sweeping the nation. Blizzard-like conditions slamming the northwest, well, searing heat re breaks records in the south. Dallas even reaching 94 degrees yesterday, smashing a record set back in 1917. We've got team coverage and your full forecast as Mother Nature throws yet another curveball. Say yes to Michigan, a swing state primary kicking off in the Great Lakes this morning. Voters there heading to the polls. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley looking to pick up the pieces after that blowout loss in her home state of South Carolina over the weekend. But former President Trump is campaigning as if Haley isn't even on the ballot. Comes as both Mr. Trump and President Biden announced dueling trips to the southern border later this week. We are covering it all. We've also got a health alert for you. Cases of a nasty stomach bug are surging nationwide, especially in the Northeast. So what's behind the uptick and how can you stay healthy? The doctor is in later in the hour. And the battle over your next burger is heating up. Wendy's is now toying with surge pricing. But just how are diners reacting and how could it affect your next fast food? food splurge. I guess I'm glad we have sort of off eating hours usually. <laughs> we yeah. might not get impacted Other by people that. don't want a burger by 9 a.m. Exactly. Like we do, I so will. We <laughs> More on that in a little bit. We're of course starting with the wild weather that we're seeing across the country. Yeah, several cities are enjoying unseasonably warm temperatures in Texas. Dallas even saw a record high yesterday. In the northwest, storms brought snow and blizzard-like conditions to parts of Washington, Oregon, and the northwest Rockies. All of this as a severe weather system is making its way across the country. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us from Dallas with the latest. Hey, good morning, Priscilla. Good morning. The splash pads across the city, including here at Clyde Warren Park, are working overtime already, and it's only February. As it stands, the city could break a more than 100-year-old record today as temperatures reach nearly 90. This morning, an unusual winter warm up with the Midwest getting a glimpse of spring as the South sees summer like temps. We are enjoying summer in February. The sunshine is much needed. Dallas reaching 94 degrees, smashing a record set in 1917, more than 30 degrees above average. The warmth stretching across the Great Plains. It is 79 degrees outside and there's people fishing on the lake right now. The higher temps also raising the risk of wildfires. With strong winds and dry conditions putting 22 million under red flag warnings Monday. It all comes as the Northeast is experiencing one of the warmest winters on record. Cheers to the groundhog predicting an early spring. But the unseasonable heat is setting up a weather whiplash. After hitting 80 today, St. Louis will drop to 38 degrees by Wednesday. As Chicago and New York prepare to see temps plummet more than 20 degrees in a 12-hour span. Winter set to make a return as some Americans soak up the heat. Our thanks to Priscilla for that report. And for more on the unseasonable, unseasonal temperature whiplash, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Boy, it was an incredible day heat-wise. We saw multiple, you know, dozens and dozens of these record highs coming in across the country. We saw warmest winter all-time temperatures set in places like Omaha as they headed to 80 degrees for folks there. Now they're going to start to see those temperatures taking a tumble. Some sections of the country 
country, still going to be warm. You heard Priscilla talking about it. We've got 80s on tap for Wichita, running nearly 30 degrees above normal for this time of year. Chicago is set to hit 77 degrees, almost 40 degrees of t above normal for this time of year. In places like Dallas, Little Rock, once again, are going to be well into the 80s. Dallas potentially flirting with the 90s yet again today. But it's a quick change over here in places like Chicago, where our high will be just 27 degrees. We're going to see about a 40 degree temperature drop uh, in just a matter of 24 hours. We'll see Kansas City drop to the upper 30s. Temperatures will be a little more typical in places like Oklahoma City, but a big difference from what they're dealing with today to tomorrow. We keep the warmth, especially across portions of the, the East Coast, places like Atlanta, ending up into the low 70s, Raleigh, upper 70s. So we're still going to be above normal. Washington, D.C., about 20 degrees above normal here as we get into tomorrow. But that, of course, doesn't last either. We see the more mild conditions kind of settling in here as we round out our work week and head into our upcoming weekend. One note, though, it stays mild Thursday, Friday, but look where we go by Saturday. We're back into the mid-60s. We look to Wichita. Temperatures are in the 50s on Thursday, back to the mid-60s by Friday, and upper 70s on Saturday. So we're going to see, again, I think the only way to put it is a roller coaster ride of temperatures. We are in the 50s by Thursday in Dallas after dealing with the 80s and close to 90s early in the week. Back to the 70s by Friday and low 80s return to the forecast for our friends in Dallas by the time we get into the weekend. So uh, a bit of changing kind of pattern here over the next couple of days. So don't put the parkas away just yet. We're going to need them, but we may not need them for very much longer. Here's the deal, though. With, with all of that heat, we kind of have uh, some fuel with this powerful storm, work, storm system working across parts of the Midwest. And that's leaving us with the potential for some of these strong storms to develop as we get into the evening hours tonight. Afternoon to kind of overnight is that bigger range of what we can expect. But we've got major cities like Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, Louisville, all included in this. The biggest threat is going to be the potential for hail up to golf ball size. We also, though, could see some of those stronger winds, 60 miles per hour or greater. And we can't rule out tornadoes, which are fairly rare for this section of the country during this time of year. But of course, not out of the question. Here's the storm system that we're going to watch. It's also going to bring some rain, some snow. Um, not all that impressive amounts of either of these, but still, it'll slow you down for the travel, especially as you get into tomorrow for the second half of the day across portions of the East Coast. It'll be a little soggy on those roads. And behind it, of course, that cooler air starts to work in. Here's that rainfall forecast through the midweek inch to two inches is going to be the higher amounts that we see out west. They're also going to be dealing with rain and snow. We've got 7 million people included in these winter alerts. They extend from the Rockies to the Cascades, the Sierra. Uh, that's where we're going to watch for is some, once again, troublesome weather here across that region. We've got another storm system that's going to work on shore here as we get into tomorrow. It focuses on the northwest, especially coastal areas of Washington, Oregon here as we get into your day tomorrow. Um, this is going to last into your Thursday, too, but heavy rain, some strong winds. The closer to the coast you are, the stronger those winds will be. We've got wind alerts up for folks there, too, and we're going to see some really impressive snowfall amounts, um, an inch to two inches per hour and for prolonged periods. So across parts of the Cascades and the Sierra Range, likely to see some really impressive snowfall. A bigger picture kind of look, I think two feet, four feet, up to six feet in some of the um, lower elevations. But notice, we could see up to 12 feet of snow across the Sierra Mountains. That's going to, of course, present a problem when it comes to traveling across those mountain roads. We've seen it time and time again so far this winter. Um, so just a reminder that if you thought winter was over, yeah. it, it, of course, is not, guys. We still have you know, a little su a taste of summer to deal with across the south today, um, and then more snow out west. No dancing in the fountains there. No dancing. Yeah, it's a big difference. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my gosh. Unless All it's right. made of ice. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, Angie. Angie. The polls are now open in Michigan where voters are casting their ballots today in the presidential primary. Voting began earlier this morning in the crucial swing state. Former President Donald Trump is looking to expand his lead over his lone remaining rival, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. He's handily defeated Haley in every nominating contest so far this primary season. Today's vote is taking place as both Mr. Trump and President Biden Biden announced dueling trips this week to the southern border. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Dearborn, Michigan, with more on what's at stake today. Gabe, good morning. Hey there, Joe. Good morning. The polls just opened here at this high school cafeteria, and it's getting a little busier here. By all accounts, this is a key swing state in an unusual primary. Former President Trump is pretending that his rival Nikki Haley doesn't exist, and meanwhile, President Biden's biggest challenger really doesn't. 
This morning, a high-stakes primary is underway in Michigan, the critical swing state that Donald Trump won in 2016 but swung to Joe Biden in 2020. Now, President Biden facing fierce backlash from the state's huge Arab-American population, demanding he support a ceasefire in Gaza. Some now plan to vote uncommitted in protest. You cannot continue to use my American tax dollars to um, aid and abet in an ongoing genocide of my people. Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, is a national co-chair of the Biden campaign. What if uncommitted has a strong showing in this primary? I think there will be a sizable number of votes for uncommitted. I think that it is um, every person's right to make their statement about what's important to them. Whitmer also brushing off concerns over Mr. Biden's age. What do you say to those people within the Democratic Party who would like a candidate, a younger candidate such as yourself, to replace President Biden? I would say the train's out of the station, get on board. Overnight, the 81-year-old president speaking out on late night with Seth Meyers, comparing himself to the Republican frontrunner, who's 77. Number one, you got to take a look at the other guy. He's about as old as I am. Number two, <laughs> it's about how old your ideas are. And a showdown coming between the two this week. Mr. Trump is planning to visit the southern border on Thursday. Now President Biden says he's going to, setting up a dramatic split screen over immigration. I've been planning to go Thursday. What I didn't know is uh, my good friend apparently is gone. And overnight, the president slamming Mr. Trump and House Republicans for the stalled border funding deal. He's saying, no, don't do that because that'll help Biden. Help Biden? It's about, not about Biden, it's about the United States of America. And here in Michigan, Nikki Haley faces an uphill battle after that sizable defeat in her home state over the weekend. But she remains defiant and is planning to head on a nine-state campaign swing heading into Super Tuesday, Joe. All right, Gabe, thank you so much. Well, now to the war in the Middle East, where this morning President Biden is saying he is hopeful that there will be a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in place by Monday. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez has the latest from Tel Aviv. These comments from President Biden are the most optimistic we've heard from any world leader so far about the prospect of getting a deal. And his words are being carefully listened to here in the Middle East. This morning, new hope for a ceasefire in Gaza. After President Biden said he believes a deal can be reached within a week. My, my national security advisor tells me that we're close. We're close. It's not done yet. And my hope is by next Monday, we'll have a ceasefire. The president's comments coming while filming Late Night with Seth Meyers. He later noted the holy month of Ramadan is coming up. There's been an agreement by the Israelis that they would not engage in activities during Ramadan as well, in order to give us time to get all the hostages out. But officials say there are still significant gaps between Israel and Hamas. A source familiar with the talk says they're focused on a compromise offered by the CIA director for Hamas to free around 40 hostages, including women, in exchange for Israel releasing around 100 Palestinian prisoners. The deal would pause the fighting for several weeks and get badly needed aid into Gaza. Yesterday, aid supplies dropped by parachute by Jordan's military. Crowds gathering on Gaza's beaches and venturing out on small boats to retrieve the aid. And in northern Gaza, the UN warns famine is now looming, as Israeli restrictions and a total breakdown in security means it can no longer deliver food. Samia al-Masri trying to feed her family by frying pancakes out of barley meant for donkeys. Her children dodging gun battles to find firewood. Words can't describe the tragedy we're living in, she says. While back in the U.S., new details emerging about the airman who died after setting himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington. I am an active duty member of the United States Air Force. 25-year-old Aaron Bushnell was wearing his uniform as he recorded his own death, calling Israel's war in Gaza a genocide and shouting free Palestine as the flames engulfed him. The Air Force says he was an active duty member of an intelligence unit based out of Texas and died in a Washington hospital hours later. Now, Qatar's foreign ministry was asked today about the president's ambition to have a deal wrapped up by next week. They said they couldn't comment on it, but they are pushing hard on both Israel and Hamas to come to the table and to make an agreement. Back to you. All right, Raf, thank you.
In Houston, police have released new body camera footage showing the moment gunfire broke out at Joel Osteen's Houston megachurch. Police say they are still in the early stages of the investigation and are continuing to review evidence in the shooting that left two people injured. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us here on set with the details. Hey, Emily, good morning. Good morning to you. The roughly 25 minutes of video released by Houston police shows numerous angles of the terror inside the church as it was unfolding. The chilling images coming just over two weeks since the deadly incident Incident, and we want to warn you, the video is hard to watch. With their ages. This morning, new video from Houston police capturing the barrage of gunfire that sent worshipers scrambling for their lives inside Joel Osteen's Houston mega church. I got one female shooting rifle. I'm pinned down with this walking. Authorities say the shooter, identified as 36-year-old Genesee Moreno, tried to enter the sanctuary, which was locked, so began firing in the lobby just ahead of a Spanish service. Let's approach. We need approach. Come on. One officer heard praying before running towards the gunfire. Father God, just be with us. Police say one 47-year-old church member was shot in the hip, and Moreno was gunned down after making bomb threats. Stand out! Police never found any explosives. The TABC agent told Ms. Moreno to put her weapon down, but she refused. The agent fired his duty weapon again, striking her. She was declared deceased at the scene. Moments before the gunfire, security footage shows Moreno pulling up to the church in a trench coat and walking in with a backpack, two rifles, and her seven-year-old son. The young boy is seen covering his ears during the shooting and at one point appears to reach for his mother. He was struck in the head during the shootout, but it's not clear who shot him. Over the weekend, his grandmother posted on Facebook that he's making progress and now is breathing well, but may soon face his sixth surgery since the incident. Houston's police chief tweeting, no child should ever be placed in that position. He needs our support and prayers. Pastor Joel Osteen moved to tears upon returning to Sunday services. I mean, the woman was troubled and it's, you know, nobody brings their son or comes to some place to do that. So I guess I just felt the, the gravity of it all. And there's still no word on what might have motivated this devastating shooting, but investigators say Moreno was carrying an AR-15 with the word Palestine written on it, and they found anti-Semitic writings during a recent search of her home. Of course, this remains an active investigation. All right, Emily, thank you so much. Yes, thanks. We've got more to come on this hour of morning news now, including the pretty nasty stomach bug that's spreading across the country, especially in the Northeast. We've got some tips on how you can stay healthy this winter. But first, the sons of that American couple who police believe are dead after their yacht was hijacked in the Caribbean are speaking out. Their emotional appeal for answers up next. Now to a terrifying story that's unfolding in the Caribbean. Officials believe an American couple is likely dead after their yacht was hijacked by escaped prisoners who allegedly threw them overboard. The sons of the victims are now speaking out. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz joins us with the latest on the investigation. Hi Liz, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yeah, the couple who are from Virginia have been living on their yacht for years. Their dream life sailing from place to place in the Caribbean now with this nightmare ending and family and friends are desperate for answers about how and why this happened. This morning, there's an ongoing search in the Caribbean for a retired Virginia couple missing and presumed dead after they were allegedly attacked by escaped prisoners who hijacked their yacht off the island nation of Grenada. The suspects committed several criminal acts, including bodily harm to the couple. The terrifying incident unfolding 10 days ago. Authorities say Kathy Brandle and Ralph Hendry, who have lived on their yacht Simplicity for a decade, were anchored in the harbor when these three fugitives who escaped that same day targeted their boat and attacked them. Shock, despair, fear, sadness, hope, love. All of those emotions are going through our head at the same time. The couple's sons, Nick and Brian, detailing a violent scene on board. An altercation of violence took place on the boat, which is clear evidence seen from um, blood on the boat, as well as their possessions being thrown around and strewn around all over. Grenada police believe the suspects threw the couple overboard before making their way to the nearby island of St. Vincent, where the yacht was found abandoned. Police arresting the escaped prisoners, but Kathy and Ralph have not been found. 
Based on the investigation thus far, it is presumed that Ralph Hendry and Kathy Brandel are deceased. The shocking attack rocking the tight-knit sailing community and raising questions about safety in the Caribbean. It seems like a bad Hollywood movie. Rob Mahar is a fellow sailor and the couple's emergency contact. What are the questions you have right now? It's hard to think of their last moments um, with, with uh, the idea that they might have been thrown overboard alive, bloodied. Uh, it's difficult to conceive for a friend. Their family describing Kathy and Ralph as a joyful, loving couple who were living out their golden years by fulfilling their dream of sailing at sea. Now, local authorities say the suspects are cooperating with their investigation. So far, they've been charged with immigration-related charges for unlawfully going to St. Vincent. The couple's sons, in the meantime, have made their way to the Caribbean, and the U.S. State Department is also now involved as the search continues. Savannah. All right, Liz, thank you so much. International headlines now. Sweden has cleared the final hurdle to join NATO after years of negotiations. Claudio Lavanga joins us with that and more from Rome. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Joseph Anna, good morning. Well, that's right. On Monday, Hungary's parliament overwhelmingly approved Sweden's bid to join NATO, as you mentioned, following two years of intense negotiations. And the prime minister of Sweden, Ulf Christensen, called it a historic day and said that Sweden is leaving behind 200 years of neutrality and non-alignment. He also added that we can safely expect that Russia does not like Sweden becoming a NATO member. Well, that's because Sweden's accession to NATO is considered another geopolitical blow to Russia. Russian President Vladimir Putin after Finland joined the alliance last year as a consequence of the war in Ukraine. Now let's go to Brussels where on Monday farmers clashed with police during a demonstration there. The farmers were protesting against red tape and competition from cheap imports from countries outside the European Union. Brussels police said that about 900 tractors entered the city as a show of force just as the European Union's agriculture ministers were meeting. Now the demonstration got out of control when farmers started spraying police officers with liquid manure and threw eggs and flares at them. Police in riot gear sheltered behind concrete barriers and barbed wire and responded with tear gas and water cannons. And let's send this tour of the world in England, where a proof copy of the first Harry Potter novel sold at an auction for almost $14,000. The copy of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was bought in a second-hand bookshop in London in 1997 for just 50 cents. Now, the book was an uncorrected proof coffee, copy, it even said it on the cover, because the author's name was down as J.A. Rowling instead of J.K. Rowling. Well, by the way, it is Rowling, not Rowling. And as if by magic, 30 years later, one mistake turned the book into a gold mine. That is wow. wild. That's I incredible. love hearing about Magic. people finding these things that end up being <laughs> worth something. Very cool. Claudio, thank, thank you. Thanks. Coming up, the latest out of Oklahoma and the death of a non-binary student there. After the break, the walkout at Next Benedict's former high school and the vigils held in the teen's honor all across the country. That's next. We're back now with new details about the death of a non-binary teen in Oklahoma. On Monday, dozens of students walked out of the high school next Benedict attended to protest what they say is a culture of bullying with little accountability. Next died a day after getting into a fight with a group of girls in a school bathroom. Meanwhile, people across the country are holding candlelight vigils to honor Next and other victims of bullying. For more, we're joined by NBC News out reporter Joe Yurkaba in Oklahoma, not far from Owasa High School. Joe, thank Thanks for joining us so much and for your reporting on this. First of all, just catch us up on what we need to know about this case and also just give us a sense of the mood on the ground there this morning. Sure. Well, what I'll note first is that friends close to Nex here have told me that he actually preferred he, him pronouns. There's been some confusion about his identity. We had really limited information, but they said that he preferred he, him and identified as trans. So that's what we've been using now. Uh, but people here are feeling a mix of grief and anger. Allie, a close friend of Nex, told me that she keeps expecting to see him in art class. Um, and, but students in the community uh, are also feeling angry because you have to remember the context this is taking place. In Oklahoma leads the nation in bills targeting LGBTQ people with 54 right now. Um, and the students also say there's a pervasive climate of bullying at the school, and they think that that contributed to Nexus' death. 
So we understand about 40 students took part in yesterday's walkout. Tell us about it and, and how the school responded. Sure. So the walkout was peaceful and mostly quiet, except for when people, you know, including bus drivers, would drive by and honk their horns and the students would cheer. But the walkout organizers said that their message wasn't really political. They just wanted to draw attention to the bullying at Owasso, which they said often goes unpunished and causes students to feel like there's no point in asking for help. And so the school district has told me that it, quote, takes reports of bullying very seriously and have policies and procedures in place to address such behavior and all reported bullying accusations are investigated by administrators at the school site in which they occur and are reviewed by the district's director of safety and security. Joe, we also know that there's newly released police body cam video in it next claims that he was jumped after an incident in the bathroom. What else can you tell us about this video? Sure. Yeah. In that video, Next says that three girls had been bullying um, him and his friend, and he didn't report it to the school because he said he felt like there was no point. And so after the girls made a comment about him and his friend, he threw water at them, and the three students jumped him in response. He said they fought. He blacked out at some point. And unfortunately, the video doesn't show us the actual fight. Uh, you just kind of see students walk out of the bathroom at the end. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions here. All right, yeah, a lot of questions. Joe Yerkeba, thank you again for your reporting. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate it. And we do want to note if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Let's switch gears here to cases of the norovirus. That's the stomach bug. They have been surging across the country this cold season. Here in the Northeast, we're seeing a serious spike in cases. The CDC says an average of 13% of norovirus tests have come back positive since January. That's more than any other part of the mm. country. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now with everything we need to know about this recent surge. It's given people a few, yeah, a few, a few chills here. <laughs> Let's start with the basics. What's the Norovirus, and why do we think we're seeing more cases in the Northeast than anywhere else right now? Yeah, Joe Savannah, it's a very common virus. It's it tends to be seasonal. We see it right about now. This is a peak time for it. Lasts until about April. And it's a common stomach virus. Some people call it the stomach flu. It has nothing to do with the flu virus. It's its own distinct virus. And the symptoms are unfortunately vomiting, diarrhea, stomach pain, and especially in younger and older people, that can get so severe severe that they can get dehydrated. So we really have to watch. Not, there's not a cure or a treatment other than supportive therapy. So really hydration and rest. And it is super contagious, which is why we're trying to warn people, great hand washing technique. It passes person to person or through food, contaminated food washing foods and fruits and vegetables and washing your hands, and I've got a tip for how to do that well, can definitely help to stop the spread of norovirus. Wait, give us the hand washing tip now. I feel, <laughs> just in case we don't ask it later. I know, <laughs> Set, setting you up for this, sing happy birthday twice. So okay. you can sing happy birthday right. to yourself or happy birthday to someone else. But that's, that's the that best way to you, get in at I, least 20 seconds. I thought you might have like some new song or something. Yeah, right? same. We knew that <laughs> one. No, I wish. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay. okay, fine. We'll do another one. I'm going to get a Taylor Swift song. Okay. Try to do a Taylor Please, Swift. Please, thank you. Yeah. My the third stanza yeah. of the... <laughs> um, Dr. Exactly. Patel, okay, so even though that's is not really related to the flu, in the way that the flu or colds are, I understand it can actually be sort of right. seasonal with typically a rise yeah. in cases between November and April. Of course, we're right in the middle of that. So why is that? And, and is it spiking even more than normal this year? Yeah, it does have, so a lot of it has to do, it, you can see the virus at any time of the year to be clear, but we tend to see it kind of in these like kind of colder to spring months. And of course in the Northeast, we're also going through that transition phase. And that is, tends to be kind of one of the reasons that we think that this virus is more popular as well as the fact that foods, remember this kind of comes in foods and vegetables and we don't have a lot of those fruits and vegetables growing in our part of the country, so we're getting them from different places, and sometimes we're not necessarily washing them as well. So there are a lot of things that add up to that seasonality, but in the end, it's just horrible. People, of course, do not want to get this, but if you do get it, this is important. You can still transmit the virus even after your symptoms resolve. So unlike most things, Joan Savannah, when we say, when you feel better, you're not as contagious, you can still be contagious for several weeks after resolving this illness. So just to be warned, if you've got somebody in your house that's sick, it's all the more reason to figure out a song so that you can wash hands <laughs> and wash surfaces 
and not share any utensils. Mm. I share cups and spoons with my family members. I, I even pick off their plates. If they're sick, probably not a good time to do that. Yeah, for a long period of time, my goodness. Is your stomach so, hurt? I mean, it's like, yeah. making my stomach hurt. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it is making my stomach hurt too. Okay. So if you, if you think it's happening to you, just know that it, uh, for 14 percent of the Northeast and about 13 percent of the rest of the country, it is happening. To yeah, you, probably. So, but, I mean, where it's especially happening, it. we got schools and daycare centers. Obviously, that's yes. where a lot of the outbreaks yeah. happen. Are there things that schools can do to try and prevent the spread? Yeah. Yeah, schools can, and, and they're doing all these things. I think it's just so hard with little children because their fingers are everywhere, doorknobs and, and on the surfaces. So cleaning down those surfaces and kind of getting rid of any of these like contaminants can certainly help. But it's also, honestly, this sounds terrible, but it's just reinforcing kind of bathroom hygiene, which trust me, I've got a seven-year-old. That's not always easy, <laughs> but it's, it's often related to kind of bathroom and recess and lunchtime behavior. And so it's just a matter of isolating those cases and unfortunately, we've got a lot of other viruses going around. So for many people, you're like, I don't know what I have. Can I have something else? It's possible. But if, it, if you've got that vomiting, stomach pain, and diarrhea, it's probably the norovirus. And again, remember, no treatment, nothing I can call in as a doctor. So just start that supportive care, but seek out professional help if you know that you're not hydrating, if you feel dizzy when you stand up, if you know that you're feeling a little weaker than normal, that's a, often kind of a time to ring for help to get additional aid. Oh, I'm going to live in fear oh, okay. until the spike is over. <laughs> okay. Dr. Patel, thank you very much. Lots of sanitizer here. All yeah. right. Thank you. Now to a very different medical story that asks the question, what if you could slow down the aging process and live not only longer but healthier? Well, a new lab is actually on the forefront of that work right now. That's right. And NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett got a chance to check this out. It's at Northwestern University. Maura, great to have you on set. Good morning. Good morning. Guys, this story was absolutely fascinating. I got to meet the doctors who are researching new therapies and interventions to slow down the aging process. And the goal isn't that you live forever, but like you said, Joe, to live healthier longer. And anyone can be part of the study. So I signed up for a day of testing to get a sense of the innovative research. Fancier robe than most hospital gowns. The start to my experience at the Podestack Longevity Institute felt more like a spa than a day at the hospital. But the actual testing began like any okay. normal doctor appointment. Dr. Doug Vaughn explains they'll do several tests across various body parts, essential to figuring out how people age at different rates. We measure uh, a variety of different things that change as a function of age. We do physiological measures, we do structural measures, we do molecular measures, and we sprinkle in a little bit of AI as well that gives us an overall picture of what your biological age is. His team wants to compare chronological age, or the number of years you've been alive, to biological age, or the wear and tear on your cells and tissues. The reality is that you know people in your family, you know people in your life that seem like they don't age or people that age more rapidly than others that might be modifiable if we can find the right ways to intervene. I was curious where my age would fall on the spectrum. So in the interest of science, it was time to suit up for the first test in the bod pod to measure body composition and fat percentage. Stylish. First off, help me understand why a swim cap and compression clothes are necessary. It involves air flowing around the body. So by having this compression material, the air flows more smoothly. Feet flat on the floor, hands resting on the top of the thighs. Great. So it kind of feels like I'm in a single person spaceship in here. It's really tight quarters. And when the test gets started, there's a clicking behind my head that I can hear. And the air pressure slowly increases, kind of like when you take off in a plane and your ears feel like they're about to pop. Next up, a retinal scan of the back of my eyes. We're going to be taking pictures of your optic nerve. So now we will dim the lights. Still there. Nice big eyes, you're gonna see a bright light. Mm -hmm. There's the flash. Okay, there's the flash. These images of the veins and arteries behind the eye. These are your blood vessels. Can reveal high blood pressure, early signs of blindness, and complications from diabetes. Next up, heart health is tested using an ECG to check rate, rhythm, and for any structural flaws. This ECG is normal, but the AI program can see things that we actually we cannot see looking at this sort of visually. Finally, a gait analysis. Sensors placed on my ankles and waist, which track how I walk. Feels a little different when you're being taped. <laughs> Showing live feedback on the researcher's screen to monitor how my nervous system responds. After about three hours of testing, the results are run through AI analysis to dissect my data, which ultimately told me that my biological 
physical age is just about right on track with my actual chronological age. If you want to think about potentially extending your health span, the right diet, exercise, healthy habits, avoid high risk activities. I wouldn't be surprised to learn that uh, stress reduction might impact upon aging. Stress reduction in this job is a little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> Do your best. The research team expects to find varying results from patients across all backgrounds. We intend to enroll all different socioeconomic groups, all different ethnic groups. We are particularly interested in studying and bringing in people that are disadvantaged with regard to aging. Researchers say these disadvantages can be related to diet, education, proximity to a green space, environment and air pollution, even zip code. With all of this in mind, the goal of the research, instead of extending one's lifespan, extending their health span. We can just slow down aging a little bit. Hopefully we can push back the onset of these aging related illnesses and that's your health span. So living a healthier life longer. Right. And guys, these doctors are just getting started. Hundreds of people from across the country have already signed up to get the testing done in Chicago. And that's the best part. Anybody can sign up for the testing. And it's free mm. with the caveat that the data from your results will be used as part of their research. And so in the meantime, as doctors are working on the research to develop these new solutions, the results come in just a few days. So you can start making adjustments to your lifestyle in real time. Oh, wow, a trip to Chicago? Yeah, there you go. My, my alma mater. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, so yeah that that's is, true. That is fascinating. And huh. it's amazing what we can do with this technology. Yeah, so. just cool. good information to have, I guess, totally. to make some edits. All right, Mark, More. great to have you on set. Thanks. Coming up, the burger battle that's brewing this morning at one big fast food chain over surge pricing. Yeah, it's not just for hotels and ride sharing anymore. First, though, after the break, why the FTC is suing to stop a major merger of two grocery store giants in a deal worth billions. That is up next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. The Federal Trade Commission and a bipartisan group of nine attorneys general are suing to try and block a proposed merger between two of the largest grocery store chains in the U.S. That's right. Right now, Kroger is the second largest grocery chain behind Walmart, and its proposed $24.6 billion acquisition of Albertsons would give the combined company approximately 710,000 workers at 5,000 stores with roughly 4,000 pharmacies. Well, the FTC is worried that this could kill competition and push prices even higher than they already are. NBC News legal analyst Danny Sabalos joins us now to talk more about this case. So help us understand the government's case here. What is it that they and, and the nine attorneys general are worried about? One word, monopoly. We have a strange system in America. We say, go out there, become <laughs> captains of industry, try hard, build a company. But don't be too good, because if you're too good, then you own the industry. And if you're a monopoly and there's no other competition that's bad, then the government's going to step in and break you up, as they've done in the past. So the argument here is simply, if one company owns all the supermarkets, they have no incentive to lower prices, and they have no incentive uh, to treat their employees well. Because if they're the only game in town, hey, you got to pay this price for this apple. And as a worker, you have to pay what we're paying you, because where else are you going to go? Kroger says for its part that they would divest about 400 stores and they're also saying that denying this merger emboldens those other bigger companies, Walmart, Amazon, things like that. Do they have a point here? Sure, that's always the other side of the coin. The private company's argument, anytime they're being sued for monopolistic activities or uh, a government's effort to break them up, they say, wait, 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 wait. We are, we may be big, but we're doing lots of good things. We break up our ownership. And by the way, there are other guys out there that are just as big. There are other mega supermarket stores uh, that are doing the mm. same thing. But, you know, in a sense, the modern supermarket is something that didn't exist, you know, 30, 40 years ago, where you can go and, and and buy a t-shirt and you can buy a watermelon and you can do your banking and you can go to the pharmacy. And those are services that these uh, mega stores do offer. But the question is, uh, at what point does one company own too much of it? Because clearly once that happens, if one company occupies the entire industry, then they, of course, have no incentive to offer competitive prices or treat their employees well. Mm -hmm. So this is certainly not the first time the FTC has tried to block a merger. What typically happens in these types of cases and then what's next with this specific one? Yeah, oftentimes the parties reach an agreement. And just as uh, we were talking about a moment before, they might divest some ownership of the company. Uh, but ultimately, even this litigation itself can be damaging 
to the company. And it's really difficult to say which way these cases go, because uh, what do you have to compare it? You can compare it to the airlines, but are airlines like supermarkets? No. Are, airline, are supermarkets like Sirius merging with XM Radio? No. You can't really compare the two, mm. because every industry is different. So almost every time you have one of these cases crop up, a lot of it is hypotheticals. Literally, in the FTC complaint, they engage in a formulaic hypothetical. Well, what would happen if this merger did happen? So you're sort of doing this apocalypse scenario on the government side, which we don't know for sure would happen, although we have a general idea when one company owns everything, it's usually not good for the consumer. Mm -hmm. All right. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Danny. Let's get you more financial headlines now. Disney has shaken up the leadership of its live action film studio. CNBC Savannah Hanau has that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe, Savannah, good morning to you. Yes, so Disney is overhauling the leadership of its struggling movie division. Sean Bailey, that's the longtime president of film production at Disney's namesake studio, is stepping down. He's overseen a recent string of disappointments, including the Marvels, which brought in far less than a Marvel or superhero movie typically has at the global box office. Now, after leading for several years, Disney lost the top box office spot to Comcast Universal Pictures in 2023. Microsoft is adding more features to its AI chatbot co-pilot, which is powered by ChatGPT. Now, when you open the tool, you'll find a new list of GPTs tailored for fitness training, design, planning vacations, and finding recipes. Microsoft also says you'll soon be able to create your own customizable co-pilot. That feature is still in testing. And the CEO of Kellogg's is taking some heat on social media over comments he made during an interview on CNBC last week. Gary Pilnick saying the company is advertising cereal for dinner to consumers looking for more affordable food options. Kellogg's tagline reads, give chicken the night off. Prices for groceries and food at restaurants have soared since the pandemic in 2020, and food companies have raised prices to cover higher costs for labor, shipping, and ingredients. Cereal prices alone are up 30% over the past four years, guys. Mm. Wow. All right. So I want to thank you. You got it. A quick dinner during rush hour could end up costing you more next year. Mm -hmm. That's because Wendy's is testing a new menu complete with surge pricing for some of its most popular food items. The announcement is already receiving backlash from customers who are fed up with the rising cost of fast food. NBC News senior business correspondent Christine Romans is serving up the details. Hey there, dynamic pricing is a common practice for hotels and airlines, even ride shares, changing the price of services depending on demand. But this latest announcement from Wendy's has many wondering, is it coming for your burger next? Choose wisely. Choose Wendy's new pretzel baconator. The latest baconator isn't the only new item hitting Wendy's menu. The fast food giant planning to test out dynamic pricing as early as 2025. It's a practice that charges different prices for the same items based on demand throughout the day. For example, a cheeseburger and fries could cost you more during the lunch rush than during a down period. I would not never expected a fast food restaurant to do that. On a call with investors, Wendy's CEO Kirk Tanner says his company will invest $20 million on digital menu boards, allowing customers to see the updated prices. Beginning as early as 2025, we will begin testing more enhanced features like dynamic pricing and day part offerings along with AI-enabled menu changes and suggestive selling. Fast food restaurants already dealing with blowback on soaring prices from their customers as stories of $18 Big Macs and $7 Egg McMuffins at McDonald's went viral. Now adding dynamic pricing to the mix could potentially be damaging to the industry. I don't think anyone's going to pay extra for the exact same thing that they were getting for less. In fact, one survey finding 36% of consumers would order less often from restaurants adopting the practice. You'll have to be really careful about not angering consumers who are already kind of inflation wary. And that's actually what's made the industry very sort of hesitant to dive fully in. There are definite risks involved. And they really don't want to anger customers. But these fluctuating prices are nothing new to inflation fatigued consumers who are used to seeing surging prices on everything from airlines to concert tickets, like Taylor Swift's Eras Tour Ticketmaster drama. Oh my gosh, we spent $899 per ticket. Dynamic pricing is the worst. And ride shares like Lyft and Uber notoriously face backlash from consumers when riders see unexpected costs. Usually Uber's like $8, $10. Tonight, 
it was like 50 something bucks. Little did I know about surge price. But experts say this is a rare move from the fast food industry, which has been hesitant to sink its teeth into varying prices. This would be a big deal for restaurants if this was widely adopted. And it's really going to depend on how customers react. You know, customers are okay with it, you'll see more of it. And if Wendy's test doesn't work, for whatever reason, you might not see it that often. We reached out to Wendy's, telling us in a statement overnight, dynamic pricing can allow Wendy's to be competitive and flexible with pricing, motivate customers to visit, and provide them with the food they love at a great value. Back to you. All right, Christine Romans, thank you so much. Coming up, we're celebrating Black Western heritage this morning. After the break, a look at a storied Texas tradition and the tie to Beyonce. We're going to explain next. Welcome back. Well, New York City might be the last place you'd think you'd see an abundance of wildlife, but one of our boroughs, Staten Island, there's some un... <laughs> Wanted neighbors there ruffling some feathers. Could you all hear that? Like I could. It turns out turkeys, <laughs> ew, stop that noise, have taken over. You heard that right. Wild turkeys are roaming the streets, and officials now say they are here to stay. Turkeys were first spotted on Staten Island back in the 1990s. Lately, though, the population has exploded, and they are gobbling all over the borough. The problem's gotten so bad that officials are seemingly throwing their Wings in the air, so to speak, encouraging Staten Islanders to embrace their new neighbors. I don't know about that, Joe. But what noise are you talking about? I don't hear anything. Stop it. I'm not sure what you're talking about. What's the noise? <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> All right. Rodeo season is in full effect in Texas, and the oldest black trail ride in the country is winding its way through Houston. NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson takes us there. By wagon and on horseback. More than 300 black cowboys and girls ride into Houston. People hear trail ride, cowboy, cowgirl, and they don't always think black folks. Why do you think that is? If you see on the TV, it's all white cowboys. But in Texas, in the late 1800s, as many as one in four cow hands were black, a legacy that Murtis Dightman Jr. wants to protect. Each year, he and the Prairie View Trail Riders journey 80 miles to kick off rodeo season. Why does it matter to keep this heritage alive? That's what we are. We go cowboys for life. This is my brother. This is my son. The Bundage family has been on this ride for 40 years. Six months I was out here. I was very proud to bring my son out at three months last year to continue this tradition. That tradition of black Western heritage also getting a boost from one of Houston's biggest stars. This ain't Texas. Beyonce making history as the first black woman to top the Billboard country chart with her song, Texas Hold'em. The banjo created by enslaved Africans featured prominently. Instruments and folk songs brought from Africa contributed to the foundation of country music. Lessons in heritage empowering the next generation. It's a big part of my history and it goes back to where my dad, my dad was born, my, my dad's dad and, and so on. When you see these kids now carrying the flags, you see these kids working on the horses. That tells us that it's going to continue. It will never stop. Priscilla Thompson, NBC News, Houston. Hmm. Very cool. A tradition passed from generation yeah, to generation. Yeah, amazing to see. Also looking forward Beyonce. to more of Beyonce's music. Yeah, for real. <laughs> with this next I, album. I cannot wait. I know. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Stay with us, though. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.